Good day and welcome to David Joshua Ford Live. This is episode 66. And on today's show, we're going to talk about sustainable creativity. And we're also going to talk about PTZ joystick control, which I have down here on the desk, which are maybe two topics that don't um, relate, but they were kind of what I'm dealing with this week in terms of technically, um, but also creatively. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, if you are in the chat, um, do say hello, where you're from, love to hear from you. And if we have any questions as we go along, drop them in the chat and we can answer those um, towards the end. Um, or if you have anything related to what I'm talking about, you can always chime in and we can try and answer questions as we go along. Um, to kick off the new year, I wanted to talk about sustainable creativity and avoiding creative burnout. I don't know if it's just me and my viewing patterns and what the algorithm is dishing up to me on YouTube, but it feels like as we've entered 2024, I seem to be getting a lot of creators talking about burnout and how they're quitting YouTube. There's some um, notable ones, um, such as like Tom Scott, I think probably, you know, was the guy who kicked that off at the beginning of 2024. Um, and there was a number of other YouTubers that quit. Um, one that I follow, Caleb Pike, put out a video a couple of days ago, and he had a bunch of really good um, rules of engagement, I guess, for how he's going to approach YouTube so that it doesn't dominate his life. Um, and the other big one was Matt Pat, who I must admit I didn't actually know who Matt Pat was before I saw his very emotional um, farewell to his community. So it sort of got me thinking, like, have we hit peak professionalization in social media in 2024. Um, I feel like it's sort of the point at which these the input of these platforms are requiring, um, sorry, that the input these platforms require is greater than the output that they return. So this is not to say that, you know, social media is dead or anything like that, but I do feel like we might be at some sort of turning point or some sort of pivot um, and that could probably also be added to by AI coming into the public consciousness and a lot more content that's very easy to create. So if you think about it, being a, a creator and you're spending a ton of time making content and putting that out there, and then you're trying to compete with AI, which is going to bring in all of this, um, I would kind of say lower, lower quality content to some degree. Um, it's just going to be a lot harder to compete with that. So. <clears throat> I feel like maybe there's the confluence of those two things. And also post pandemic, uh, you think about the pandemic, everyone was staying home, consuming a lot of media, and there's a lot of people who um, got into YouTube and sort of invested a lot of their time and resources over the last three years or so, and are now maybe hitting a peak. Um, so if you think about that as any other industry, um, there's a period of which in your life when you're very early on in filmmaking, at least you're probably like, I remember back in the noughts and the, the 2010s, it was kind of like you, you get in there and you just sort of say yes to everything. And you are often doing some things for free or collaborations or things just to get experience or networking. And then you get to a point in your career where you, you don't want to be doing those things anymore. It's not worth your, your time and effort. And so then you sort of mature in your career. <clears throat> so I think for me that probably there came a point a couple of years ago where I felt like I'd sort of matured in my career here in New York City and I was ready for something new. And um, so for me, at least, if I look at 2023 year in review, that was having a baby. And that certainly, you know, threw another complication into life. So... I mean, I guess when you're sort of two adults going through life and you're both professionals, then there's plenty of time just for your schedule to be what it will and um, you can control that and then you throw a baby in there and it um, needs to be reconfigured. So um, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on my my last 12 months because it sort of is the, you know, having a baby obviously affected many areas of my life, including what I'm doing on YouTube and the amount of time that I have to put into that. Um, I would have enjoyed to have more time to put into YouTube and to create more videos, particularly um, sort of short films and sort of short content that has there's more edited. Uh, but for me, the challenge is just time. And so I guess the 
the compromise I was able to make was that I was able to, for a lot of the year, do one live stream a week because I've been able to automate so much of this process that I don't have to worry so much about production because you know the lighting and the cameras and the run of show is all kind of mapped out. And so I have an hour of prep time to sort of come in and just sort of get situated. And then I have an hour with you guys talking. So compare that to when you shoot a video and it might take you a day or two days or whatever. And then there's probably a bunch of different slots of editing over the course of a week. So it can take a lot more time. And there's certainly times where I have shot things and then not uploaded it to YouTube because I just didn't have the time to edit it. Um, ironically, there was a video I made a, a year or two ago about editing using DaVinci and it was a two-part series and I only released one half because the second half is still sitting on the hard drive and I haven't had time to get to it and it's probably, you know, past the point of being useful by now. Um, but if I look at um, 2023, my daughter Colette was born last February and my wife and I were going to have six months each of full-time childcare, which I think at the time I just said, yeah, sounds great. Like I'd love to spend time with her. And because I run my own business, I can control my time and I'll just kind of build that in. And uh, it was it was definitely a learning curve because there's not, um, yeah, there's a lot of things to think about. Um, so, but it, it was a good forcing function for me of thinking about how I spent my time and going from having just like a ton of time to work on whatever projects I wanted, um, big projects and small projects. And then I really had to, in my professional work, recalibrate the jobs that I was doing. So it was choosing a certain um, budget level and saying like, I'm not gonna go under this. And so that meant cutting out a lot of um, day shoots, which if you've got a week where maybe you've got some post-production work on, but you know, on a Tuesday, someone asks you to shoot and you're like, yeah, I could fit that in. If it's under a certain um, price point, just having the discipline to say, no, I can't do that um, is difficult. Um, but when you literally don't have the time because you have a child, um, that it was a forcing function for me that made me rethink how I did my professional jobs. Um, so I culled all of those small day jobs and that actually gave me more time for development on bigger jobs. And it also gave me more energy for those jobs because, you know, I'm looking at like a great budget. And so therefore I'm like excited to work on it because I want to make it as good as I can. Um, so since September, I have been doing um, my six months of full-time daddy daycare, as well as running my business and everything else in life. And it has been, uh, it's, it's been great and it's been a challenge. Um, I did have a bit of help from my mum, came over at the beginning period of that from Australia for a couple of weeks. And that just helped me finish off some of my workload and sort of um, scale that back a bit. I wouldn't have been able to get that done without her being able to look after Coco at various points during the week um, to get things done. And um, and then in sort of October, November, it was it was really full on in terms of just when when you're full time with a kid, it's like Monday to Friday is a job with her. But then you've got the evenings and you're still on and then she hasn't been a great sleeper. So it's often waking up in the middle of the night time and not getting sleep, doing it all over again for the rest of the week. And then on the weekends, you also get to hang out with her. So. Um, it's just sort of more of a seven day job and trying to fit work into that was always a bit of a challenge. Um, so that said, I did actually have my best financial year yet. Um, I also had the most time off I think I've had. I probably had about four months off um, in terms of some paternity leave when she was born. We had a month down in Australia and New Zealand in May to sort of introduce Colette to the family. And then in August, we went to Italy for sort of for a wedding. Um, we had a good time there. And then I had um, December off. So I've, I've been able to have four months of the year off. Um, so that's been really good. And that is actually my 
is one of the reasons why I run my own company and do my own business because I like the freedom to be able to say, no, it's December and I'm going to fly to Australia for Christmas and sort of take that extended period of time. Um, so I do really like that way of working. And for me, I think it gets me into a rhythm of working hard, particularly in New York, it's kind of like the spring and fall, a really busy period. So like working really hard then, having a sort of a slightly slower summer and then over the New York winter, ideally going down under for the summer there and just really disconnecting. Um, and that has normally in the last 10 years given me the um, energy to just come back to New York and be really excited to tackle the year because otherwise I would be uh, going a bit crazy. And I have been going a bit crazy because <laughs> there was pandemic for a couple of years. Um, so I couldn't actually get back to Australia for that. And then I did the green card, which meant I couldn't travel. And then Eleanor was pregnant, which meant we couldn't travel. And so when Colette got to three months, that was the first time that I was actually able to get back to Australia. Um, but th I also found the my workload towards the end of last year was wasn't sustainable. Um, there were different types of jobs that I had that was just interesting in terms of when you're thinking about your positioning and what you're trying to work on um, is something to think about because I do quite a range of things from photography to video production to live streaming and um, which is good because I think it gives me, I, I like it because it sort of keeps it interesting. You know, like today I was shooting photographs and now I'm live streaming and it sort of mixes it up. I always like sort of trying new things. But there's some things that you can do with a baby and some things that you can't. So I had a couple of travel shoots last year to Fargo and Atlanta and Texas. And so for those, uh, obviously Eleanor had to look after Colette and I was just off traveling. Um, so that sort of takes you away from the family. The my. My sort of ideal job is when I'm more of an EP, and so that can be um, a job comes in, have a couple of calls and emails to get a sort of get the ball rolling, do the the sales on it, and um, close it out, put a crew together, and then have um, I'm thinking of one shoot in particular where I, I had Colette on the shoot day, and I'd packed like I prepared the gear the night before, and then the crew came in. And I was there with Colette and I sort of briefed them on that. And they went off and did the shoot. And I was able to just sort of check on text message occasionally, just see everything's going well. And meanwhile, I went to Madison Square Park and hung out with Colette. And like that was kind of like the ideal EP type shoot to have um, because it, it gave me a lot of flexibility around being able to be with her and still sort of getting jobs done where I didn't have to be um, client facing. But then there's other jobs that I do that, I, I, that doesn't really work for. Like I did a really big live stream installation last year for a fashion designer. I sort of showed some things on this channel. And um, I don't know, I don't know anyone else who I could outsource that to or like freelancers that I could hire to put that together. So it was something where I, I had to do the job and I had to like had the knowledge base to sort of put all that together. Um, so that took up a lot of time. And uh, there was some of it which was like programming, which I could do offsite, and the rack build, which I was able to do here in the studio. But then there are other times I just had to be on site. And that was certainly a challenge um, with Colette full time. So I was able to call on some friends sometimes to be like, hey, can you take her for three hours? Because I need to go be with the client. Um, but then there's, there were some other jobs where I did um, uh, in the, like video production jobs where there was more like the scripting side of things and post-production and then the shoot days are often quite small. So if you can get a shoot done, then the, the pre and the post can kind of be on your own schedule. The challenge I found was that because I was like full time with her all during the day and then getting it down at night, it's like there were some days that I was working through to five in the morning and that's just unhealthy and unsustainable and um, kind of led to me getting burnt out in December and, and it's certainly not what I want to carry through this year. Um, it's the sort of thing where you've, you've been working all night and then I sort of come to bed, but then Colette has woken up 
And so I've got to go into her room and feed her and like, it's like, oh my God, I just want to go to sleep. And then you got to get up at seven or whatever when she gets up and um, have the day with her. So that, that sort of stuff is not, not fun. Um, so I had to do some recalibration of what I, like my own expectations on myself. And that's one of the challenges when you work for yourself is you can just push yourself very hard. Um, like I can be the worst boss. Hang on a sec. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, like things that I wouldn't ask my crew to do that I would do because I'm sort of driven to get it done and it's my business and I will see the reward for it on the other end. Um, so I, I came to, which doesn't feel like much to say now, but I think back then it was hard for me to accept was that as much as I was wanting to be like full time looking after her for six months until she gets to sort of 18 months um, or maybe 12 months to put her into daycare, um, that I, I wasn't able to do it all myself. And so we had to get some help. So <clears throat> ended up getting a babysitter one day a week, which was, she was fantastic. And that just gave me like some hours of the week where I could plan ahead to like, okay, I'm gonna do the shoot on this day. Um, or just like to go into the office to do admin and um, make sure that I, because it's a different sort of, um, when, when you have the time structured, it feels different. Like for example, in the morning, maybe I take Colette around Madison Square Park for a walk and she'll go to sleep in the stroller. And then I'll, because I'm like two blocks, my office is two blocks from the park. I'll come back to the studio and she'll sleep here for an hour while I get some stuff done, but it, it feels like you're just trying to like get some emails done. It's not very productive work because I don't know when she's gonna wake up and then I have to go back to that. Um, whereas when I can say, okay, on Tuesday, I have eight hours, um, you know, I'm gonna schedule, like I do, I do, I treat my time differently on those days because I, um, it's very limited time. So I do very focused work. And so like, I'm less likely to answer emails for example, on those days, uh, maybe I'll check in the morning and at the end of the day, but during the day, I'm like, no, this is my time to focus on this project because if I don't get this project done in a certain amount of time, I'm going to, um, I'm not going to get it done. I'm going to take a sip here of my tea. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, and then this year, it was like a slow start to the year because I had COVID at the very beginning of the year, that thing was just like going around again. So that kind of then went through the family and it meant that I couldn't get into the, the babysitter rhythm and I had to um, do that. So now it's like, it's good to be like back in the chair and I feel like I have some of my own time back to be able to do these things that I find invigorating. Like the, the creativity behind putting this live stream together each week is really fun because it gives me the chance to try out new things and to test things. And these are like things that I learn here through trial and error or just like getting something going. Um, I can then actually apply to jobs and installations that I've done. So it's, it's really um, useful time to be able to have this time to live stream and also just, you know, it's fun to chat with you guys and um, work through that. So um, that has been, some of what I've been processing because I do want to, I would like to do more with YouTube. I think it's just always a matter of time and it's trying to work out because I've noticed with some creators, they get some success and then they sort of like build a team and then, you know, editors and whatever. And, and in building the team, they've sort of created a job and sponsorships and all that. And then that machine has to keep running and it can become like you have to do that whether or not you're feeling inspired. And so I don't want to get to the point with YouTube where I'm feeling like it's something that I have to, um, something that owns me. And that's what I appreciate about what Caleb said in his video. I'll put a link to that later. Um, because there's, there's a lot of things on YouTube, a lot of videos about like how to optimize and the way your thumbnails need to be and your post schedule. And that's all probably true, 
but you've got to be the one to execute that. And that takes a certain amount of time and resources to do that. And that's where you've got to look at the balance of are you getting more back from YouTube than you're putting into it? Because it's, it's very easy to put in a ton of time and sort of, I don't even say unpaid work because you're sort of agreeing to do it, but um, it's very easy for YouTube algorithm to sort of pick what it wants and it doesn't really pay attention to the fact that maybe you've spent a lot of time on something. So you got to take that into account and just sort of be realistic about that. Um, so, <clears throat> 2024, uh, some things that I want to do here in the studio that I've been thinking about um, is just how to um, simplify my workflow. And I've done a lot of that already through the um, companion software, like most of this runs itself. But there's still some things where like each week I have to come in and HR graphics, I have to like repin that to the window and get certain things set up and um, paste the YouTube key into HR graphics to pull in the comments. And so I've been able to, I, I want to just, I think one of the things I want to do is get like a Mac mini into the rack that's just going to run the live stream um, so I can sit down in the chair and not um, tweak things so much. And the other one I want to do is a bit more audio. I've got at the moment a just like a Zoom live track L8 here, which has sort of manual faders on it. And I want to get sort of digital audio into the rack and have that automated and off the desk. Um, it's sort of automated because the mix that comes from my microphone here is going through the ATEM and the ATEM on off and faders and all that are automated through companion. Um, so I don't have to think about that so much, but I would like that to be more networked so that I could tap into this studio remotely and, and run something from here if I was somewhere else in the world and one of my crew could be you know, running a shoot here, but I could still be kind of here digitally. And um, it's much easier if all of that kind of stuff lives um, in, the, in a digital world that you can sort of VPN into. I've also laid out my desk in a, I don't know if you can quite see here, um, maybe I'll pull back here. Um, so I've just put it square here and it's sort of against the wall because it's fairly small space, but I just, I didn't want to have to like squeeze past this side of the desk because when I pack, I often do that behind me and, you know, Pelican cases and all that kind of stuff. And if, if this space gets too difficult to move in, that's not fun and I, I don't want to have to move the desk. Um, so there were some things where like this angle, for example, is it's off. Um, and and the, the sound panels here I have, obviously being a grid makes this very obvious. Um, ideally, I would have this desk centered in the room and the camera would be centered and it would just be a very square shot, which I think it would give it a lot more strength to the composition. Um, but it's a compromise to just say, you know, the ergonomics of this space is such that I don't, I want to be able to do other things in here other than sit down and live stream. And so compromise is that, for example, this is not square. This is, you know, this should be more whatever this is. The desk should, should be like this. And uh, those sort of things kind of eke me a bit, but um, it's fine. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to live with that. So, and then you can get that kind of shot. Um, the the other thing I've done, because I used to be doing lapel microphones just because it could mean I could move around more, but I've gone back to a shotgun microphone just so I can sit down at the desk and I don't have to worry about batteries and mic placement and all that kind of stuff. Again, these are the sort of things I'm trying to do to simplify my life, to have more time so that the time that I spend live streaming, I can think about the content that I'm making and what I want to say and, and just sort of being present rather than tweaking all of the production things to, to get the shot right. So um, that's that's been a bit of a, a time saver and makes it just easier than like a whole nother thing and to work out with clothing. Um, and what else? That's probably some of the main things that I want to do. I actually realized like it was like a year ago, now that I've got the two R5C bodies, and, and then I got a bunch of new RF glass. I've got, and, and the gimbal and the drone, it's like I've got all of 
the production things that I need to make a really great video. And I don't have any new gear that I'm like, oh, I really want this gear or I have to get something. Like I've got the stuff that I need to make whatever I need to make. And now I just need the projects and the time and the inclination and the energy to, to go do that. Um, so that is, uh, it's been interesting. I think the only things that I wanted to add in are just some of these little live stream things to streamline the the rack and just make it so that I'm doing even less. So it's sort of set up and it's just on and I don't have to um, don't have to worry about it. Um, where are we up to? Uh, Larry says, what shotgun mic? Um, I have two, I have, actually I have three, but, um, I have a 416 Sennheiser, uh, but I decided not to put it here just because it's really nice having some kit that is like packed and ready to go. And so the microphone that I've got in here is the, I can't remember, it's like, is it Sanken or something? Um, it's a shorter shotgun mic. It was still like 800 bucks, so it wasn't cheap, but it was, I was looking for a good quality short shotgun microphone that could be mounted to the camera if I needed more ENG style work rather than like a longer shotgun. So um, that is the one that I've just decided to install here and I'm using an old Rode boom arm that um, I, <clears throat> let me see if I've, if I can pull up here. Um, this is a very old Rode boom arm from like 15 years ago that I bought in Australia and it's kind of falling apart, but it doesn't move anywhere. So I was just like, I'll use that one. And then my main boom arm is something that is packed in the kit. So again, it, it's just trying to work out ways um, in which I could not have to break down the studio to go on a shoot. And um, it's also nice with like, I've got enough lighting here to kind of mostly leave all, all the lighting in place. And then when I go do interviews and like whatever, I have um, other 300 Ds and whatever that I can take to do that. Occasionally I need to tap into some of these lights because I don't want to have like a ton of gear, but um, that is nice having the sort of studio set up and then um, other gear back behind here in the, the racks that is stuff that I travel with and do the production work with. Um, let me have a look here. Larry says that it sounds good. Um, yeah, excellent. I, I also just spent more time tweaking the expander in the ATEM software because I think I probably hadn't fully set it up um, correctly. And so I, I just spent a bit more effort of um, doing that. I think one of the things is, and I maybe need to tweak it further, but the, um, obviously like the closer you have a microphone to you, it's gonna sound more present and sort of richer and warmer. Um, but you also have more, you, you don't have as much leeway. So if I'm moving off mic, um, it might go down a bit. So I think that's where having the microphone placement just like a little bit further back, like instead of it being here, this probably looks different. I don't know if you can sort of see how far it comes in, you know. So I've got like two feet or something from me. Um, it's it's kind of like, you know how light falls off exponentially. So if you move a light double the distance, it's, well, what is it, the square root? I can't even remember. Anyway, but it's like, if you move the light um, back the same distance, you don't get like half the fall off. You get like the square root or a one fourth or I don't know, something like that. So it's the same sort of thing with sound where um, if you move back further, then there's more latitude for movement, um, which is obviously one of the nice things for with a lapel microphone, it's always like placed there and um, you're not really going off axis as much. Um, but that's something I've been been thinking about that. Inverse square. Um, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to uh, uh, remember what that was. All right, let's move on to the next section. A PTZ joystick control for around about the $500 mark. 
and um, I have the AV matrix here. Now, I've got Canon PDZ cameras, and Canon does make a controller that's about $2,000, and then they brought out a new one, which is about $5,000. Um, but the, the profile that I've developed that runs on Companion basically does like everything that I need it to do and much faster and better. Um, the one thing that it is sort of uh, missing is is maybe like a joystick when you're trying to do more like live following something around. So th this is obviously maybe not the smoothest of motions, but um, so here's a, this is like the manual. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so I was looking for a, a console that wasn't $2,000. I wanted it to be good quality and I figured around the $5,000 mark there were a bunch that were still available. Um, so this one, let me see, let's pull this one up. I got two. So the one that I got was, this is back in, back in Black Friday. So my return window closes very soon. And uh, hence why I'm like, I need to do this show to compare these two. Um, there we go, boxes. Um, so we've got the, the AV matrix is the B&H one. Um, let me put this one up here. So that's the one that I bought here, down here. Um, and then the other one that I figured I would try out is the Feel World KBC10, also around about $5,000, $5, and but also you can buy a version of like AV cans on Amazon for about uh, $450. So um, keep, keep that in mind um, as you, let me just pull it wider here. Uh, so these are the two that I got. Um, I'll just start with the the feel world one because I didn't like it. I didn't like it, and so I, I barely opened it up. Um, let me cut to this one. Let's see what I've got under here. And so you get your power brick here, some cardboard. I'll put this together later. And then you get this console going everywhere. All right. Um, I got this one out briefly, didn't even take the wrapping off it, and I just I didn't like it. Um, you can see it is, uh, is this the right one? I think this is the right button. Um, you can see the, it's like much bigger than this other one, and the buttons were just a little bit, um, is this gonna do, nope, this is the wrong button. I don't have the right button here. Um, yeah, the, so I haven't fully tested this one out, but I just felt like I did not like the the button layout here, and like there was only four cameras to recall here instead of six, um, and yeah, I just didn't like the the physical layout of this one once I opened it and I sort of saw that, and it's got an Ethernet port. I can't remember if this one's PoE over Ethernet, um, but anyway, suffice to say. Uh, Comparing these two, I like. I looked briefly at this one, and I thought, I don't have the time. Remember what we're saying about time, and you know, YouTube, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I don't have the time to fully look into it. So I just put my energy into this one, which is the AV Matrix or AV Cans. Uh, it's one of those things where they they look the same, but I assume they're different companies. It's hard to say. Um, did have some problems with it, which I'll show you in a sec. Where was it? So the, the problem I had was when you access this via the web, it didn't actually have any software installed. Um, let me see if I can find this. Like I went to the, the web address and in recent, I just got to find the screenshot here, make this full screen. Um, where are we? So it was basically like, saying upload some firmware, but then I couldn't actually find that on the website at all. So it took me a while to figure out, like it's, it still worked when I plugged it in, but well, it turned on 
and there was a system there, but it wouldn't connect to my Canon cameras. Um, so uh, I think it's this button. Let me see. No, it's not that one. <laughs> Six, seven. Is it this one? There we go. All right. Um, so what I was able to do is once I was installed the software, I was able to get a Visca Sony running, and Visca Sony actually worked with the Canon cameras, whereas I couldn't get Visca just working with the Canon cameras. Um, but this uh, this one actually quite quite liked the sort of ergonomics of this one a bit better. So uh, let's go through that one. I'm just going to quit this. And um, also quickly, if you if you do get this one from B&H, which is the AV Matrix um, model here, and there's no software, um, you can actually install AV CAN software on it and it will work. So um, the one that I went to was, uh, let me find here, um, avcans.com and under services download is the, where did it go, joystick controller. And you go download and it just opens up like a, a Google drive thing, um, puts in the downloads. And then you would go back to that web address and upload it there and install it. And um, I should have brought that one up, but I, I did not. Let me see. I can't remember what address it is. Um, I think it was like 131 or something. 13. Nope, can't remember the web address. Um, all right, so let's come over to this one. Now, this one has the joystick controller, which you'll see on my face here. You can adjust the, the pan and tilt here. So from 100 up to, let me see if I can get this one here. Here we go. All right. Zoom out. Um, so this is on like a fast setting. And then you can turn it right down and you can get uh, where are we? Like a slower setting like that. I, I still found like it takes too long to sort of adjust that and you've got to like look at the, the little thing down here to see what speed you're running at. So I, I think in a in a production environment when you're trying to move quickly, this will be very difficult to use if you're doing this across multiple cameras. Um, so I feel like you're probably better off just like choosing a speed and then just sort of working with that. Um, if you tap this, you'll change between zoom speed or pan and tilt speed. Bring this one in. Um, and let's go back to, where are we? Is it this one? No, what am I hitting? Sorry, I'm trying to remember what button to press. Here we go. Um, okay. The, the menu is here, so you hit set up and you can go through IP configuration, uh, 154, that's what I had, 154. Let me see if I can go in here. Number 2168.8.8.154, okay. There we go, admin, admin. Um, and then you once you find your IP address, you will get into more of this kind of, um, window, and I, I think it's admin. Is that right? Okay. And then, so in your software here, this is where you can search, and you'll see the cameras come up. So this works quite well. Once you've, like, loaded the software, because this wasn't pre-installed, but I was able to install that. Um, and so you can search Fisker or on VIF. Um, so I have selected my camera and then instead of uh, Pelco or Visco, you can choose Visco Sony and you would add that one in. I'm not going to do that, um, but that's the one here. I've added these two in already. Um, IP port 52381 um, and I can use this controller at the same time as I can use my, this fella over here. My, my actual, so the profile that I've built in Companion to control um, six cameras 
I can I can do that at the same time as using the joystick. So um, ideally what I want is just a joystick that companion can speak to because I'd like to be able to just like select the cameras on here and then the joystick control is updated in terms of which camera it's targeting. Um, but we haven't haven't quite got there yet. Let's jump back to over here. Okay. Um, so you can work your way through the IP, netmask, gateway, exit, um, in terms of DHCP is a, a nice way to sort of find that on the network, and then from there you could make it um, static. Um, LED mode, uh, assigned key, advanced, what's under advanced, trackback. I haven't gone into all of this version, reset version. This is version 1.97D plus and 1.7 exit, reset, exit. Okay, um, so that's kind of the menu there, which is pretty simple. Um, you can, these buttons here can quick select control between um, cameras one to six, and you can also reassign them to other things. So I've just hit um, camera one, so you can see I'm zooming in here. And then camera two, and it takes, I think it takes a little second to, for it to like jump between cameras. Um, so you can have six buttons here. So that's nice because it's like very easy to like select which camera you want to work with. But again, if you're sort of jumping between cameras, it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, the, this button here is like camera search. So you can, you can do the same sort of like um, search that we did back over here on uh, on the web interface. The web interface is once you, if you can get that up and running, it's probably a little bit faster and easier to use. But um, you can actually use it on on this control panel um, quite quite easily as well. Back over here, and uh, let me just get out of here. Exit um, camera. So then you can recall a camera. So I could go. Wait, hang on. Camera, sorry, two. No, hang on. Enter a number first. Two, camera. Is that right? One, camera. No, camera, one. I'm not doing that right. I think this is like, so you can, um, sorry, I've got to zoom back right in, right in here so you can see what I'm doing. Um, this camera button, I think is like you select camera and then you can recall something greater than six if you don't have these shortcuts here. Um, the Then you've got the call, so you could, I'm on camera two and I'm going to call four. Is that right? So it's going to go over there. Um, call three. Um, so it'll recall things. Um, but again, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm used to my own profile and like I have like experience with that now. So, but for me, switching between like a recall mode and a different drive time to get smooth maneuvers, I, I find much harder on this kind of things. Um, whereas with the the companion stream deck, it's uh, there's a lot more functionality there, I think. But I'm biased. Um, and then reset will clear the position. Let me call three. I think that was right. No, three call. For some reason that didn't quite work. Um, it's mostly a joystick for me. And then there's also the, the zoom here, which is quite nice if you don't want to do the, the twisting zoom. Um, I wasn't able to get the focus to work on this. The, I don't know, it just didn't, there's autofocus and manual focus, but it didn't seem to translate to the Canon cameras. The, is this working? The, the blue gain and the red gain, that wasn't working. Um, the auto, the exposure one was, that sort of is, uh, that's working, so that's that's good. And you can hit auto exposure, where are we? Auto exposure, and it'll set it however it likes. Let's go back to my preset here. Um, anyway, that's about it. I think uh, that was, I, the, the purpose of this exercise was if I wanted a professional PTZ joystick to add into what I've got, and I don't want to spend more than about $500, um, then this 
uh, seem like like a really good solid quality build. It's nice and small, so it's not taking up too much of um, the space. Um, having said that, I'm not going to keep it because it it just I don't like it. You know, I think um, maybe if I had a long conference and we had the camera that we really needed to like, you know, use the joystick on all day. But I don't think I'm really going to work that way. I think I'm I'm going to be building presets. And then I'm going to be triggering to go between that to get smooth camera moves and um, or even like Canon's auto tracking software as expensive as it is um, works well and is is a sort of better way of working with a PTZ camera from what I've found. Um, you will notice I have I've plugged in power here. Um, I think it's coming over here. This does actually take a PoE instead. So let me see if I've got. No, that's not right. This one, um, that's not right either. Let me go to my camera, this one, and go to the desk. Okay. Um, so on the back panel here, we have um, an on-off switch and then the power input, but you don't have to use that if you've got um, a PoE. I'm just connected to a switch that doesn't have PoE, so um, I couldn't do that. But it's really nice having PoE, so you just have one cable and you don't have to worry about plugging in um, a connection here. So yeah, we've got um, a locking locking barrel connector, which is really nice. And then we've got some tally things and some, uh, what do you call it, RS-22 or whatever. Um, and then the sort of Ethernet one here. Um, so I really like this unit. It feels like a solid build and um, the the ergonomics and the layout of it were much more compelling to me. Um, I'm going to jump back to my shot here. And whereas compared to where's that other one? Ugh. This this Feel World one just felt kind of kind of clunky. Um, obviously, I've not given it enough. I've not given it enough of a run um, to really compare, but that was my initial thing, was just like this one was the one to to get. And um, if you go to Amazon, it was a little bit cheaper than um, B&H. Um, yeah, bouncing around here. Anyway, um, <clears throat> let's go to some, ah, last section here, 47. We've got about 10, 15 minutes left here. Uh, I'm going to sit down and grab my iPad and um, uh, see who we've got here. Um, Jules, great to have you here. If you are in the chat, um, make sure you drop a, a question in there and I'd love to be able to answer that. Or if there's anything that I was um, talking about in the first section about how you're spending your time this year and what sort of creative projects you're working on and how you're sort of balancing that across other life aspects. Um, I'd love to hear about that. Um, and then if you've got any other questions about this particular PTZ console, we can we can take a look at that. Um, but great to have um, Jules here, Uptown Neighbor, as always. Uh, I can't, where are we? Uh, Captain Media from Quebec, great to have you here. Larry Reed from Oklahoma City. Um, and like this review says, what about shutter speed and exposure compensation? Um, it's probably in there. Let me see. Setup. Let me see. Inquiry. I don't know that it is in there. From what I can, shutter speed and exposure compensation. There is, as I was showing you before, there is the um, the auto exposure, this one. I think that's right. Am I controlling the right camera? 102. There we go. Maybe it's a one press. Um, automatic exposure, or else you can turn that off and dial it in how you like. That's the iris. Um, I think there is shutter in there somewhere. Um, but I do not see it off the top of my head. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of things you may want to still go into the web browser for to adjust rather than doing that here. Um, you know, otherwise, 
spend the two thousand dollars and, and get Canon's actual actual one. Um, what have we got? Uh, the zoom button is a fine tune zoom control. Um, let me see if we've got that. So if we've got, let me just clear that. So I mean, I quite like. Wait, I'm using the wrong. Let me switch here. Camera one. Ta da! There we go. If I zoom out. <laughs> ah, going in reverse. Wait. There we go. I'm curious at the speed that it goes. So I've set my zoom speed to, let's set that to like 50%. So if I turn, it's got that kind of. Yeah, I quite like the all in one sort of pan and tilt, and obviously need more experience uh, doing gaming as a kid. I just don't think this is me to sit here all day and do a joystick. Um, okay, and then if I do, okay, so is this, my question is, is this different in terms of its sensitivity? So if I just do very, like very slow zoom, and we go. And is that different to just using the PTZ without twisting for zoom? And using the zoom, Ooh, it feels like uh, I feel like it kind of jumps, right? Like it's I feel like it's less sensitive on the the paddle here than it is on the actual twisting. If I'm trying to get a really smooth start, ah, <laughs> this is why I don't like these things. Um, Whereas this one, I found like I could actually. I feel like it was better on the on the actual joystick, turning it that way, and then you get the added sort of moving around. Anyway, uh, yeah. See, I can't run a live stream, and manually do this. Uh, d -d 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 -d. Martin says I bought a twenty dollar Logitech F. 310 game controller and use that with PTZ Director One software and it is great. I mean that's much cheaper than 500 bucks, so maybe I'll have to check that one out. Um, email me some links and I'll, I'll take a look. I know some people have been able to use um, uh, not Game Boy. What am I saying? Like an Xbox controller for these things, and, and maybe that would be useful for me to have as a backup if I needed to give that to an assistant. I just think for what I'm doing in here, I'm probably not going to um, do it. Oh, here we go. Um, Gwen says, have you considered a game controller? I use one with the Mac, um, free Canon app and CRN 500. It has compromises, but it's fairly small, fairly easy to set up. And the controller was like $50. So um, that's a really good option. I think if you just want a, a $50 one, there's, there's a few other um, joystick devices that I've seen that I would love someone in Companion to like uh, write a an app for that because all I really want is a joystick like and I want it just like small and next to the Stream Deck. Um, yeah, Eric says it seems very easy to build up an unintended inventory of PTZ controllers. Yeah, I am trying to like simplify my life, um, so I'm I'm definitely not going to incorporate this into my live stream. Um, I'm even trying to get rid of the uh, the audio um, console that I've got here on the desk. I want to like get that off and make that digital, like I was saying. I just want like a big, open, clean desk. Uh, that's the way I like to work because there's just like less stuff around. It feels less cluttered, and then you can do other things like emails and editing here. I've got these these two monitors that you see here. They um, come together when I'm not doing a live stream. And when I'm doing a live stream, I move them apart so that my camera can um, get in there. Um, and I'm also thinking I will maybe end up using just an iPad for a lot of my live streams. I think I want to kind of clear the desk even of, because the Stream Deck still needs a cable to be plugged into it, whereas the iPad you can kind of place anywhere. Also, the iPad would sit completely flat here, and I've got this Apple keyboard which sits very flat, and being black, it just kind of blends in, so it is less like gear in between me and you. So we can just sort of 
feel like we're chatting here and not having so much stuff. Like I, I try to avoid, you know, big microphones in front of my mouth and or big, um, you know, headphones um, just because I, I want it to feel less about the tech and more about um, us chatting. Uh, the best part of using Elgato Stream Deck is peeling back the PDZ controller to just what you want and just those controls. Um, yeah, if you guys haven't, I mean, you probably have the guys who are here, but if you're tuning in and you haven't seen my channel before, then um, part of what I've built here is ATEM control on a Stream Deck or iPad by a companion, but also Canon PTZ control. So under this button, let me see if I've, no, under this button, um, this is the Stream Deck. So I can have a home page where I do switching or I can jump into my PTZ controller and control up to six cameras. At the moment, I've only got two connected. So I've got um, camera one and two. And this is where instead of a joystick, you've got the, you know, the keypad um, and in and out. And so it's, it's sort of, you can, you can set sort of medium, slow and fast. Um, wait, what am I doing? No, I'm doing slow. Um, so you, you, you can get some, uh, like if I zoom out here, no wait, I'm on the wrong, let me go here, <laughs> on the wrong camera. Um, you can get some moves where, you know, you could, you could cut to that and then cut away. Um, you know, you can zoom in there. And then if you wanted to do like off air, you could put that onto fast and you could do like a, a quick, you know, re try and find something else here, like my rack down here. You know, you could zoom right in there. So, you know, and then you can sort of find your shot and swoop back over to slow and you could cut to this one and just do sort of a, a slow maneuver. But it's it's probably a little bit too different to a high-res joystick, um, but you can get some, some nice moves. The way that I normally use this is uh, what am I going to cut to? If I go to a medium maneuver and I'm going to come back up to, um, I think it was this one. So I have like different presets. Obviously, there's a long way to travel here. So if this is uh, one shot, I would then go to the other shot, which is, um, I think it was this one. So like these are the sort of on-air maneuvers that I would do and I find that much easier because I know ahead of time where I'm going to land and that's the um, like a much easier way of um, operating and it's much more fun. You can just build it into a run of show and then you don't have to like think about what you're going to hit all the time. All right, let me come back to where was I up on this one. Um, all right, just a couple more minutes and then we've got to wrap up here. Um, da -da. Gwen says, so much stuff equals the opposite of Aaron uh, Perecki. Not. Um, I mean, I guess we both have a bunch of stuff. Um, he's got all of his stuff in the background. Actually, no, I guess in his main shot, it's just kind of the wall and the lights for this kind of framing. Um, but, and I know John Barker too, I think has got that sort of control room background um, with that in the background. Um, I've done more of a, uh, I don't know, just colorful studio, very plain. Um, the way I've laid out my studio, if I can jump over, I don't know if I've got the, the coverage here. Let me see how far this camera will go. I've got a bit of junk. I can't go any further than that, just the way the camera's set up. Um, so there's some space behind me, and I've got a seamless there that I can put down. And then I've got my desk sort of in the middle of the room. And then I've got um, two monitors, my microphone, and, and then my rack is here in front of me. And that's just a 4U rack, so it's actually it's quite small. I've got the, the Extreme and the Pro here. I use the Extreme for uh, program recording. Uh, which I don't think I did today. I totally forgot to hit record. I need to build that into my run of show. Um, and um, so normally I would program record that. Bummer that I didn't. Um, and 
Then further up behind here is my um, floor monitor. And I don't know if you can see, you can sort of see the screen just up here. That's the bottom of the, the teleprompter. Um, so that's, I'm looking at a program feed there for confidence, just so I know what I'm putting to air and I can keep eye contact on the camera. Um, but then up here is my um, floor monitor, which, you know, gives me the multi-view and I can see everything that I need to in that. Um, and then, where are we? i zoom in here. Yeah, and then, I don't know if you can even see back there, because it's all very dark, but back there is like a bunch of gear and other stuff. So I'm just gonna pull back here in the frame. Um, and then this is my blurred out of focus shot that I have to start the show, just to show you that someone is in the house, even though, um, you know, uh, just, I don't know, for, what's that like, the football shot, the aerial football shot. Um, all right, coming back to, this one, uh, Eric says Aaron's got six plus cameras, um, the Lumix BGH-1. Um, I, I really like the PTZs. I've just gone that route. I think if you've got enough light, because um, they're obviously not amazing in low light, but if, you, if you've got enough light, then they work well for bringing up different types of shots and moving in between things. Um, and then it's just thinking about placement. I would like to add another camera, but <laughs> having just said previously, like, I'm fine, I don't need any more gear, I've, I've got enough. Um, I, I do think one of the things I've thought about would be nice this year is building a sort of Zoom ISO to get a remote caller into the show um, built into the rack. I can sort of do it through my computer, but it's a bit of a, you know, work around with the mix minus. Um, so getting some of that stuff sorted out would be nice for remote guests to bring them in. And then also thinking about a way in which maybe if I added in one camera, I could have um, like a guest here opposite me. So this could be my main camera and then I would have a camera back here sort of cross shooting onto that one. So that's kind of what I think about. Um, you messed up the joke. Um, I, I figured you were joking, um, but I, I think I misread that. So. Um, apologies for there. Um, Rob, good to see you. Glad you could join. Um, and uh, Larry Reed says, I have a talk show that usually has two hosts and two guests. I tend to be the engineer also, um, so looking for a PTZ camera. I have to go budget until income flows. Um, PTZ optics or AV cans. Uh, I have limited experience with them, so I would say take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, I did at one point purchase PTZ Optics and use that for a while alongside the Canon cameras. I preferred the, the image from the Canon cameras and also just the, the interface behind it felt a bit more like an actual camera rather than some sort of like technical thing. It felt more like using a DSLR sort of on a web page. Uh, so at the end of the day, I decided to go with uh, Canon, also because all of my other cameras are Canon, and I really like their the color and the lenses and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I I did buy a PTZ camera, sorry, a PTZ Optics camera, and try it out, and um, it worked well, and it seemed good quality, and it has good integration with Companion. So if you did want to use that, you could. You know, there are modules within Companion that you could use that. Um, AVCANs, uh, I've only tried this controller, which seems okay. I haven't been able to try any of their cameras. Um, on that note, if AVCANs would like to send me a camera, maybe that could be my third camera, <laughs> that can be my angle. Um, I could try that out. And uh, yeah, I, I think I remember seeing on Amazon some AVCAN stuff and it looked like it was like 1200 bucks and then you get like two cameras and a controller and it was like, it seemed like insanely cheap. Um, and I also feel like a, a number of these cameras coming out seem to have tracking built into them, which for Panasonic, Canon and uh, Sony, they seem to charge a $1,200 additional license per camera for auto tracking. So I feel like some of those um, cheaper camera brands are going to give some of the sort of higher end camera brands a run for their money because this tracking is just going to be, 
expected. You know, you think back years ago of um, eye tracking or autofocus and that kind of stuff that didn't used to be in cameras and now it's just expected that it would have autofocus. I wonder if with AI being the way it is, if that is going to be something that is, um, you know, people just expect in a camera, particularly like a PDZ camera, if you think about the, the what's the word, the philosophy behind a PDZ camera is kind of that you would not have a human operating it. I mean, the pan, tilt and zoom are robotically controlled remotely. Yes, maybe there's a person on the other end of that, but it can, you know, can very easily set up um, loops or just other automations. That means you can get these camera shots without someone having to run it. Um, so why wouldn't tracking and um, like AI face tracking be part of that? Speaking of AI face tracking, I think we've got a way to go before it recognizes people's faces. I feel like AI face, track, face, face tracking needs to be like, take a snapshot of someone's face and then actually track that person rather than just like a face. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, Rob jumping in here, he's tried PD optic, PDZ optics. Um, it's okay, but not great. Um, image quality is the same as the 10, 10 VO VH. The 20N, the software is better than PTZ Optics, um, but the 10VO is only 400 pounds. Um, yeah, something to consider if you, like, I don't want to say, like, you know, you know, invest the money in the higher end stuff because sometimes cheaper stuff can get the job done and you can move on with your life and you don't have to pour all of your money into, like, high end gear. Um, my philosophy has always been, like, I want to enjoy working with the tools that I have. Um, I think that's a really great point um, that Rob makes about the software part of it. It's not just the optics. It's like if it's not ergonomic and intuitive to use, then the actual value that you get out of these cameras is not going to be as great because you'll have a shot, but it's going to be much harder to manipulate it. So um, that's where, for me, you know, Canon checked the box of the image quality, it was a good build and um, through Companion was able to integrate that with automations with other parts of the show like the ATEM and all that kind of stuff. Um, all right, we got to wrap up here. We got to get out of here. I got to go pick up Coco. Um, let me see here before we go, because I didn't, I didn't get to this, but uh, I have some pictures of Coco that I haven't actually put on the show before. So I'm going to go, where was that? Um, this one. Where are we? Okay, this is me and Coco in Cold Spring coming up on, uh, back at Christmas time there. Uh, this is Christmas Day in her little Christmas outfit looking out our window in New York City. This is her waving from the stroller. Uh, I don't know if she's actually waving. I'm not sure if there's a thought behind that wave, but it looks like she's saying hey. So I quite like that photo. Um, this was two days ago in Madison Square Park. I often, that's where I go to walk around and get some air. It's the best park in New York City. Flatiron building in the back there, and she feeds really well in the stroller. And so I was out there in the snow, rain, hail, or shine. I am in Madison Square Park. <laughs> That's my escape in New York City from the concrete jungle. Um, and that's her little bubble there, keeping her warm. Um, and then this is her in the studio. Um, it's funny, she's getting into these like mirroring phases. Like um, I'll find like, she, like with clothes, like she'll try to like, like she's got clothing and she's trying to like put it on because she sees us putting on clothing or those headphones. She did actually like pick them up and like put them on her head. Um, which I was like, how does she know that they go on her like she must she must watch us, you know. Um I had a, a picture of her with a phone, like she loves the phone, and it's probably because, you know, we're always like looking at our phones. We do try and keep it off her, but she is like relentless, um, wants to get that phone. So babies take it all in and they see what you do and she knows how to use um headsets. All right. Um, thank you for tuning in. It's really great to be back here live streaming with you in 2024. 
I'm looking forward to a great year and just being very mindful of my time here and um, what we talk about here in the chair, as well as time that I have to create other videos, hopefully, and get that editing done. Um, but if you want to see more, um, davidjoshuaford.com is where those um, profiles are. Until next week, take care, and I will see you then. All right, bye.